The list Dr. Coop's many awards and accomplishments would simply usurp valuable podium time, and I have chosen not to do this. I am sure that he would agree that papers, awards, and citations are only a mark of a man's past accomplishments. It is our unique privilege to hear of his present concerns so that we might better focus our thoughts on the future of healthcare delivery. Ladies and gentlemen, would you join me in welcoming back to New Hampshire our esteemed colleague, Dr. C. Everett Coop. NBC, you will see um, the state of the plight 
of healthcare in America and uh, end up with not my answer to the problem, but some of the things that are being done that do deserve broader understanding and greater applicability. Uh, I want to talk today about not your personal health, but about our national health and our national health care system. Uh, I sometimes call it the national health care system, uh, but not for this audience. I think what I should call it for you is what you know it to be, and that is our non-system of health care. Because we have big problems. Um, this is a time in which we have such high expectations from medicine. Uh, we put a great deal of faith in new procedures, uh, new pharmaceuticals, new technologies, and the public continues to have tremendous faith in what I call the magic of medicine. They routinely expect miracles to happen, even though we are not able to deliver uh, in actual life. But I think it's becoming equally clear to the public that those high expectations um, are fast outrunning our ability to pay for them. In other words, we have today a gap between what we'd like to see in healthcare what is really realistically possible in healthcare. And so we're engaged in a debate of sorts, uh, which you might call aspirations versus resources. Uh, for example, uh, in 1990, the average American company spent 26.1% more on health insurance for employees than it did the previous year. Well, you know that cannot go on very long, and eventually we'll be spending 100% of the national gross product on healthcare. So we have then a rise in new technologies available to physicians, but at the same time, a decline in their significance uh, for a substantial number of their patients. Our healthcare system may function with compassion, with competence, with excellence and brilliance at times, but it does so only for some individuals. For too many Americans, the healthcare system uh, can at times be a tyranny and is more a curse to some people than it is a blessing. Now, I wanted to give you my conclusion at the start. There is no panacea for the problems we face. There is no single magic bullet. There are no easy answers, but there are a lot of hard choices. When the public enters the American healthcare system today, he or she does through, so through a doctor's office or through um, the uh, emergency room of a hospital. And um, if you are fortunate enough to be in a hospital that has a bed available, you eventually get there sometimes it takes three days, and you don't only answer the old question about will I recover, but other questions come to your mind, such as will my insurance pay for this, or will my illness cost me my savings, my home, and everything else that I have. And the American patchwork health insurance system defies easy description, but more than that, uh, it defies easy correction of its many problems. But I think we have to confront those problems we have to do it head on, and we have to do it right now. Our high tech system uh, of medicine saves many lives, uh, but it is also high cost medicine. Everyone complains about the soaring cost of health care, but I'm not sure that the American people put this in perspective. Last year alone, we spent five times the federal deficit on health care, $660 billion, and that's more than we spent on education combined. The press reported in April of this year that the health cost share of the gross natural product had risen now to 12.2% or $671 billion. And uh, that's a lot more than it was just a few years ago in 1965 when it was only 5%. I'm not here to argue about what the right number is of the GNP, but I'm sure that you all agree with me that we need a number that buys us health care and does not waste dollars on administration and paper pushing. And I don't think <laughs> I don't think the American people would pour at several percentage points higher than we have now if it purchased health care for all the people in this country. We seem to have then a system of health care that is distinguished by a virtual absence of self-regulation on the part of the providers of that health care, primarily people like us, physicians and hospitals, and distinguished as well, however, by the absence of such natural marketplace controls um, as competition in regard to price and quality and service. And I think you agree with me that there's something terribly wrong 
with a system of health care that spends more and more money on each, on each year and seems to serve fewer and fewer people. In the past, Americans turned very commonly to their insurance plans, but even those systems seem to fail today. Let me briefly summarize for you the three groups of people we deal with in this country, the insured, the uninsured, and the uninsurable. Fortunately, the largest group of them is uh, that 160 million of our fellow citizens whose insurance is purchased by an employer or a family member's employer. And these people uh, usually enjoy access to the best medical care in the world as long as their insurance holds out or their premiums are not raised beyond reach. Employers, however, are now asking employees to share a little more in the burden, so the cost of deductibles goes up, uh, there are increased co-payments, uh, and then they are also asked to give up certain services which they have already become uh, used to, so they call them entitlements. And when those requests are made, uh, employees dig their heels in and say no. And I don't know whether you realize that last year, the uh, health benefits were the major cause why 78% of those who went on strike against their employers went out in that kind of an effort. Every one of those strikers felt the pressure in their own families, in their own homes, and they not only asked for a continuation of the health benefits that they had before, but they indeed wanted them increased. Well, what is the outcome when somebody strikes for health benefits? I'll tell you what happens, I'm sure you know, more money eventually does go into employee health benefits, and those increased costs are expressed in the marketplace at higher prices for the goods that the public purchases or the utilities that they consume. And tell me, what is the point of our getting tough as a nation with Japan, uh, for example, uh, when right here, uh, we meekly give our health plans a 10, 12, or 15 percent annual increase that they demand. Now, this two-thirds of our population that is covered by employer purchase insurance, I think, is the group to watch. I'm going to tell you some prophecies at the end of this talk. Uh, but these are the people who have the most power to change things. First of all, they have jobs. Secondly, they are affluent. Thirdly, they usually are married and have families and therefore understand uh, personal responsibility, which they're not ready to abrogate. And they're getting tired of paying more and more for less and less. And when they do that, they complain to their employers. And fortunately, their employers are responding. And all over this country, in places like Cleveland and Pittsburgh and Denver and central Minnesota and northern Wisconsin, even here in eastern Connecticut and in um, eastern Ohio, there are a number of interesting experiments going on. Businesses who purchase insurance are demanding, and they are getting, higher efficiency and higher quality of care in the health provided for their employees. And these businessmen are getting a dividend which they expected, and that is that the costs are going down. Now, I didn't say the costs are leveling out or that they're not going up as fast as they used to go up. The costs are actually going down. And the reason is that the efficient providers are being rewarded for their efforts, not with more dollars, as we have done for 30 years, but with more patients. That's what the name of the game is. And these patients migrate to those high efficiency, high quality services from less efficient, lower quality services and the nice thing about that is it's developing a free marketplace, and those low quality, low efficiency services either have to shape up and conform, or they will perish. So together, the employer, the consumer, the employee, and organized medicine can provide a system that rewards high quality and high efficiency with more patients and not with more dollars. And this is known uh, in the trade as the buy right movement. And I think it's clear to me that until the public learns to buy right, what I've been describing is just that, the situation will not change. Now, the medical care financing system in this country, I am convinced, is in a self-destructive whirlpool, the vortex of which will eventually be bankruptcy. I'm sure you see it with your own patients. Costs go up, 
the insured drop out or lose their coverage, <coughs> there are fewer left to pay the premiums and therefore the premiums go further. I think that the crisis we've been talking about is really approaching chaos now, <coughs> and we have to find the right leadership to bring these groups together that I've just talked about and say enough is enough. It is not the present leadership. It is not the least the ones who got us into our current system of profligacy and poor care. And it certainly is not a coalition of business and labor because they are the ones who push the cost of insurance up all the time. But watch what happens because I think these are the people who will bring about a change. Then there are insured Americans who rely on the government, but if what I've been talking about is a sign of the times, let me tell you it's even worse with government-provided uh, insurance. These insurance plans no longer fill the bill. Everybody thinks that um, Medicare is a program that takes care of the health needs of the older people. Those of you who are physicians know that work out that way. It's not a system that provides health care for all other people. There are many holes in Medicare. Uh, they must first spend their money uh, before Medicare kicks in, and it usually doesn't cover such things as some of the medications that elderly people require to stay alive, and it makes no provision for long-term care, either in hospitals or in nursing homes. Also, there never has been enough vision uh, in government to recognize that many people who are independent and then get older and frail could remain independent if they had just one hour's help a day with somebody coming in to do household chores or a few nursing things. But instead, these people, deprived of that very simple, non-skilled labor, uh, have to find dependency, and eventually we all have to pay for it. Medicare's total bill in 1990 was $110 billion, and that is 9% of all federal spending in comparison with uh, defense, which is $24 billion. Medicare pays 40% of all hospitals' income in America, and it should account for 25% of the income of the doctors in this room if they are average physicians. Medicare for 33 million grew in 1990 by 14%, but on the other hand, Social Security for the same number of people only grew by 7%. In spite of what I say that might sound critical about Medicare, uh, I do think it's one of the most decent things that this country ever did. It removed much of the fear and uh, the uncertainty from the frail years of elderly life. And it should stand for us as a landmark, I think, of the basic decency uh, of the American ethical core. Let me say a word about Medicaid. If I sound dissatisfied with Medicare, I'd say Medicaid is a flat-footed fraud because uh, it excludes most of the poor uh, by calling them too rich. What started out as a $238 million program in 1965, and that is about like the tip for the hat check girl in Washington, has now become an $80 billion colossus. Uh, it sounds terrible, but it doesn't do what it's supposed to do, and what it is doing it's going to cost more all the time because Congress has now ruled that all children under the age of 18 be phased into Medicaid, not just those youngsters who are there now who are covered by welfare protocols. And yet today, Medicaid covers fewer than half of the children in this country who are at poverty level. It also allows terrible disparities between systems of coverage and payment. A patient can have an organ transplant in this state under Medicaid walk across the straight line, state line, and can't even get uh, primary care. So that Medicaid needs to be standardized, it has to be expanded, it has to be reformed, it will cost more money, but it has to be made to embrace families and not to exclude them. And while I'm on that subject, let me say that we as a society and as individual citizens have to find some way to eradicate poverty from this country. I really believe we never can do it, but I think we have to face it because it can be eradicated in some places. I think that American health problems stem not only from diseases of the body, but also diseases of society, and I think poverty is number one. When I was Surgeon General, poverty was what lay at the root of all the things I tried to do where I felt I was banging my head against the stone wall. 
things like drug abuse and AIDS and alcohol abuse, malnutrition, smoking, communicable disease, and so on. And when I talk to the public and not to a medical audience, and they say, well, what can I do? What can I, one individual, do about the health care reform you're talking about? And I say that anything that the public does to eliminate poverty, whether it's with a checkbook or a ballot, uh, it confronts the health care problems head on. The other thing I've got to say to this audience uh, that I think we have to be ashamed of, I think is probably less true in a nice state like New Hampshire, but access to care, that is having a regular doctor, is adversely affected by strange things, by being on Medicaid, by being pregnant, by being elderly, by having AIDS, and by being non-white. And I think that doctors in this country, where these problems abound, have got to come to grips with this and police themselves and do something about it, or the day will come when this will not be voluntary access, but it will be forced upon the medical profession. And when that happens, we are going to find, too, that many allied health professionals that we don't think are competent to take over our jobs are going to be offered the opportunity to do so. Let me say a word about the uninsured. 12 to 15 percent of our fellow Americans, 33 to 37 million people, uninsured, underinsured, or only seasonally insured. They are not old enough uh, for Medicare, not poor enough for Medicaid. These are not people on welfare. These are the working poor, frequently two jobs. Neither one has a health care plan. Total income isn't enough to buy insurance. And <clears throat> they live in dread that the next illness that approaches their family might be that which wipes them out and takes the limit that they have. And I hope you know that there is a tremendous correlation between the uninsured and medical health. Because study after study shows that the uninsured have very serious health problems. And most of the things that have been written about have to do with access. But a very good study came out uh, in the spring of this year, 1991, that showed that hospitalized patients who had no insurance had three times the death rate in hospitals of patients who had private health insurance. Now that really is unconscionable. And if we don't face this problem now, we will have to face the health care of insured, uninsured later on, and that is going to be a much bigger bill than we have now. Very briefly, there are also the uninsurable, the people for whom insurance was invented, and they can't even get insurance, either because they were born with a problem that would be expensive to handle, or they have an acquired illness or accident that puts them in that same category. And now, as you may know, with increasing frequency, patients have their insurance premium raised out of sight right in the middle of a serious illness. The disruption that comes to our society by this escalating cost of health care is simply unconscionable. <clears throat> thousands and thousands of American families are, are literally impoverished by the American health care system. And you and I cannot let that continue. And we think about the things that go on, but the thing that makes me feel more than anything else is to realize that 22% of what I'm talking about is paperwork and paper pushers, but it does not have to be that way. Sometimes the public, in its frustration, sees grass to be green on the other side of the street. Right now, they are enraptured with the Canadian healthcare system. Let me just say what I think about that for a minute. My fifth show will deal with this in some detail. But I'm convinced that the growing infatuation with any farm uh, national health service uh, is based more upon dissatisfaction with our own than it is on any knowledge of the other. Most Americans do not realize that any plan that is national in origin is based upon planned scarcity. An experience has shown the world over when government economic controls are applied to health that they prove in time to be detrimental. There is a loss of quality and productivity, of innovation and creativity. It first starts to research, but it trickles down to patient care. And the national health systems become eventually so bureaucratic that they are unresponsive to patients, and finally they bring rationing and waiting in line. 
Americans did not uh, like to give up for anything, but I think these are all for health care. I think the one thing that would keep the Canadian system from being successful here is just the difference between the British and American personalities that are contagious. They have neglected over the years the planning and capital expenditures that make it possible to adequately care for their own people. And let me tell you, if we did not exist south of Canada, the Canadian healthcare system would crumble. And as bad as our <laughs> as bad as our healthcare system is, we don't rely on Mexico to make it work. <laughs> I think we have to make changes across the board. I think that uh, the healthcare system plays a terrible moral burden for all of us in that uh, the system does not respond at all uh, to as many as 12 to 15% of our fellow Americans, but it's also a terrible economic burden uh, for society to bear in that the system satisfies its own uncontrolled needs without having a free marketplace, and this seems to be at the expense of almost every other system. Abraham Lincoln said about 130 years ago that whatever people need and can afford, they should pay for. But those things that other people need and cannot afford, the government should underwrite. And I think that there is a tremendous truth in that, and it probably should be basic to what we think about in reference to health care in the future. I want to say a few things about what I think the future holds for us, and uh, you may doubt whether I have any uh, qualifications as a prophet. I do have a beard, remember that? <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you a story that might uh, impress you more with my prophetic ability. I was addressing the Critical Care Society in San Francisco a few years ago, and uh, it was a large auditorium. I was addressing people up on the balcony as well as those down in the stalls, and I was aware that there were photographers in the wings waiting to catch me, as they frequently do, doing something that um, uh, is not very attractive, and so they caught me looking like an opera singer. <laughs> and uh, a picture appeared the next day in the San Francisco Chronicle. Uh, they didn't say much about the remarkable speech I gave, but they had a caption <laughs> under the picture, uh, which gave me new credentials. It said, looks like Lincoln, sounds like Moses. <laughs>
pharmaceutical complex. And I would look at ineffective treatment and get rid of that. But when it comes to rationing, I would ration weed, I would ration paper pushers, I would ration government watchdogs, and I would ration unquestionably poor treatment, and I would even try to ration public expectation of what we can do for them before I would ration one single beneficial procedure for a patient. The fourth thing I think that will happen is that the revolution will come from those people that uh, represent the 160,000, 160 million whose employers buy their insurance. Now, let me tell you why I think none of these things are going to work. And that is because they cannot work independently. There are a few things that are self-standing and that you could do tomorrow. One would be to have Congress say, instead of the 1,560 insurance forms we have now, there will be one insurance form, and it will be one page long, and it will start on the 1st of July. That could happen. The other thing uh, has begun. I've been working with uh, Senator Domenici for the last six months on tort reform for malpractice, and he put before Congress um, two weeks ago a very reasonable bill that uh, essentially removes jury trials uh, from the problems of malpractice, provides for compulsory arbitration, and uh, I think it will give everybody a fair shake and reduce the cost tremendously. But those things can be done by themselves. The other things really can be done unless they are all done in concert. And if uh, I were in the position to do this, I'll tell you how I would do it. I would bring together the players. And the players would be the representatives of the following. Representatives of doctors, of hospital administrations, of lawyers, because they're responsible for a lot of the mess that we're in, <coughs> of the medical, pharmacal, pharmacological, industrial complex, the consumer, uh, third party payers, and the government. And I would tell these people that everybody has to do his part in a quid pro quo arrangement at the same time everybody else does his part, and that everybody has to accept a short-term sacrifice now for the long-term gain. If we don't, the system will die. But if we do it properly, the system will survive. It will be profitable for all concerned, but it also will be altruistic in that it will be beneficial to those groups of people I have been talking about uh, this morning. Now, the one thing that's wrong with what I've told you is that any time you get those players together, you have to have somebody who acts as a remaster or a Dutch uncle. And I think there is only one person in the country today who can do that, and that's the President of the United States. And it is my absolute conviction that at this moment he is disinclined to do so. I think he's being pushed by OMB and by the crisis itself to come to some decision uh, before the election of 1992. But I'll tell you how I think um, he ought to do it. I wrote this in. Newsweek magazine, uh, 18 months ago, I told it that Mr. Bush had been uh, nominated before he was elected as president, and that is that a presidential commission is appointed of the bluest blue ribbon variety, and would consist of doctors, of insurance people, of some medical statesmen, a couple of governors appointed by the governor's council, but the most important members of that committee would be Republicans and Democrats from both houses of Congress who, in accepting the assignment, would agree to go to all the meetings themselves and not send their staff members. And that would put them in a position of understanding what was being done, but being able to take the deliberation of that commission back to the floors of Congress where legislation has to be formed. That's how we got the reform in Social Security and it could not have taken place in any other way. The question remains whether we can convince Mr. Bush to do that. I think he could solve the health care system. And you have an opportunity to tell the only man who could influence him. We can talk to the governor sooner or tomorrow. That's all I have to say. I'll take your questions until it becomes inappropriate. <laughs>
they have to be part of the group that uh, meets to discuss this problem. And uh, I don't think there's any possible way that the veterans medical system does not have to look forward to some kind of reform in order to conform to the other things that are going on in this country today. Absolutely good. Yes, I, Dr. Cooper, a couple of years ago, Special article uh, that proposed making health insurance go on automobile and the insurance and adjusting the premiums strictly based on risk and controllable factors like um, uh, weight and smoking, uh, alcohol consumption, and uh, adherence to prescribed medical regimens for diabetes, blood pressure control, and so forth. The authors felt that this proposal um, was better than other cost cutting proposals because, in addition to cutting costs, it would also make people healthier. How far could we go with something like that? Uh, I don't think more than about three feet. <laughs> <laughs> Ideally, it, it's a utopian idea, and it's what should happen. Uh, the difficulty is that uh, we've never been able to penalize people who do not practice preventive medicine uh, by raising their premiums. And suppose you did do that, you'd, have, you'd end up by having a lot of people who were not covered by any kind of insurance because they would not stop drinking, they would not stop smoking, they would not stop driving drunk and so forth. But we would still have been, we just, we would shift. We would shift the present 37 million people who are uninsured to a new group that is uninsured. So I, I don't think that, that that would really work. Ideally, it should be the way we start teaching medical students now so that when your children are sitting here having a meeting like this, uh, we aren't talking about the same thing that uh, our fathers talked about. <coughs> Uh, Dr. Coop, my understanding from the little uh, reading I've done on the subject about the increase in cost of medical care is that there are two things that drive it, inflation and, and the onset of new technology. There are a lot of things that we do now that we never did before, some of them appropriate and some of them not. Do you, do you have any thoughts about how we can control the costs associated with new technology? Uh, I don't have any good thoughts. I mentioned that in passing. Uh, I think the wrong way to do it uh, is to try to stifle research which is what many people see as the first thing to do, it's the first thing they think of. But this country has enjoyed what it has because of the kind of technology that we have fostered. Where we have to put some, some uh, brakes on the system is in what we call uh, the transfer of technology. Because we have something that was discovered in the research lab, and because it has an eventual transfer to patients, doesn't mean it should be made available now to all patients. And I think we have to recognize that one of the things that would come out of uh, any kind of commission for health care in this country is to decide what is basic health care uh, for all Americans. Uh, and I don't think that uh, we can ever avoid having a two or three tier system. There will always be people who have money to buy what they want, and I don't think anything wrong with that. Uh, but I do think that if we are going to make it possible for them to buy what they want, we have to make sure that those who don't have the wherewithal to buy what they need get from some of the source what they need. One more question, I'm going to run. Uh, how would how would you, you train in New Hampshire? <laughs>
influence and power, but the way it has to be done is that the Congress said this is always going to be a person that we can trust, a person that will not be pressured by the White House or by any other government, <coughs> and whatever he says, we know he may be wrong, but it's not encumbered by some partisan politics. And that's what I tried to do, and that's why I'm not there now. <laughs> Conventions, I guarantee you, you will not have to pay registration fees. Wow. <laughs> 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 